नमस्ते वेलकम टू माई पॉडकास्ट वॉट इज हिंदुइजम वॉट इज इट टू बी अ हिंदू डू इवन कैटेगराइज इट एज एन इजम अ वर्ल्ड वेर वी आर कॉन्स्टेंटली बम्बार्डेड बाई सो मेनी डेफिनेशन दैट कम आउट ऑफ अ वेरी डिस्टिंक्ट यूरोसेंट्रिक वर्ल्ड व्यू समटाइम्स इट इज अ स्ट्रगल फॉर ईस्टर्न कल्चर्स टू एक्सप्लेन दमसेल्स टू द सपोज एट अदर फ्रॉम द वेस्ट definitions of hinduism and the general understanding that comes out of the academic circles in india and the west are actually from the point of view of the one looking at us from the outside isn't there a distinct hindu view about ourselves and if there is a distinct view what is that view i have personally tried to find answers to these as i have tried to define my own nirishwarwad i have always stayed out of the larger atheistic family which is based out of a very distinct abrahamic world view in my journey of finding answers to this question one book that has come in very handy to me personally has been rearming hinduism by professor vamsi juluri now i'll let you guys know a bit about uh, vamsi ji vamsi juluri is a professor of media studies at the university of san francisco california he received his phd in communication from the university of massachusetts in 1999 his research interests is in the globalization of media audiences with an emphasis on indian television and cinema mythology religion violence and gandhian philosophy now that's nice to see someone in being interested in gandhian philosophy he's the author of four books his work has been published in journals such as communication theory television and new media european journal of cultural studies and critical studies in mass communications and in various scholarly anthologies on globalization audiences and indian cinema he has also written numerous op-eds and feature articles for the san francisco chronicle times of india open magazine and various other publications and he's a frequent contributor to the huffington post and the indian express welcome to the podcast vamsi ji thank you kushal ji namaste it's a pleasure to join your wonderful forum so uh, vamsi ji uh, the first question i wanted to start with was why did you name your book rearming hinduism well uh, the title followed the cover picture actually so you know i started writing the book in early 2014 and i wrote it in a very a uh, different way than i did any of my other books uh, you know i i wrote it in a storm of passion and deep deep feeling um you know wrote the wrote the first draft in just two or three weeks and uh, edited it in a couple of months and my publisher was wonderful in getting it out really quickly now i had written the book and the first draft of the book and by the time i start almost i think by the time i finished it this picture of narsimha swami at hampi uh mm-hmm. seemed to me like the most appropriate image for the cover and uh, because you know if you remember early 2014 was the time when the wendy doniger book controversy took place and yeah. uh, i had read that book and you know i wanted to respond to the controversy uh, reasonably and fairly i thought but then i could see that there was this iron wall in the media particularly the american news media where you know Uh, it was pretty clear that you know they were going to shut out people like me you know who were and somebody like me who has always been very reasonable and moderate and i could see that uh, clearly there was a very deep effort you know uh, going on to constrain the debate and i could also see more importantly the pain that millions of people including young children like the children going to school in california but going through mm-hmm. you know because of the way our idea of ourselves our understanding of ourselves is being abused and that sort of abuse in a supposedly post civil rights post racist society is unthinkable and yet you know the way hinduism was being you know abused and misrepresented in the media and academia all these things you know i just looked at this picture of narsimha swami who was uh, sitting in a you know yogic meditation pose mm-hmm. and to me it looked like he was sitting down to write something with his right hand you know i mean that's obviously not what the uh, deity really is doing probably the right hand was blessing us we don't know mm-hmm. but when i saw this picture of this massive monumental you know uh, amazing deity sitting down and his hand is missing 
uh, it seemed to me like a very apt, you know, a symbol of what was happening to our whole civilization at this time, that we did not have a hand to write our own story with. And we were intellectually, you know, uh, you know, uh, disarmed is a nice word. I would say we were intellectually amputated, uh, and that's a horrible, horrible, uh, you know, desecration. You know, that uh, when one culture is, you know, chopped off in a sense, just like the way these beautiful cultures, to use a secular <laughs> word, uh, were also defaced. So when I looked at that picture and I said, Narasimha Swami's hand is missing, and this is, you know, a sign to us that we need to figure out how to write our own story again. You know, we have not been able to do it for hundreds of years, you know, because of what has happened. And so that's when I thought, you know, the title should be, it should reflect, you know, the uh, the struggle that uh, many of us are, uh, you know, uh, embarked upon right now uh, to take back, you know, control of our own story, you know. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, when I suggested rearming Hinduism, there was the other implication of arm, which is militancy. And mm -hmm. some of my friends were worried about that. And, uh, but finally, you know, I, I decided that, you know, I, I would risk, you know, that, you know, supposedly militant title. And I knew that, you know, anybody who is reasonable and fair and reads the book would, would know that it does not refer to a militant or violent kind of rearming at all. Uh, it just says, you know, we need to rearm, rearm ourselves with, with intellect, with thought. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we also need to rearm ourselves with kindness. That is the force of all, that is the source of all accurate knowledge in my view. Yeah, and it, it, it actually also shows as to how, you know, low we have stooped in our discourse today uh, that I even had to ask you this question. I mean, <laughs> it, it is, uh, we have, you know, I believe such questions are only asked when the society at large loses its moral center. I, I genuinely believe that. And uh, I mean, in a normal set of circumstances, I wouldn't even have to ask a, a person like you that what do you mean by rearming Hinduism? But unfortunately, as I, I had uh, discussed before we started this podcast, I was like, I'll have to clarify this because the the atmosphere has become so toxic now mm -hmm. so, so you know that's how we have so now i wanted to jump in part one of your book which is desikala dosha and uh, obviously you have divided your book into two parts where in the first part you actually talk about what uh, the academia uh ta you know says about hinduism and obviously you've paid special attention to wendy doniger and uh, uh, you also call it the ideologies of Hindu phobia. So when you use the word Hindu phobia, what exactly do you mean? And uh, uh, I wanted you to explain a bit of uh, the manifestation of this Hindu phobia. And uh, so how does this Hindu phobia come across in the academia? Where when we say Hindu phobia, what, what exactly are they saying that is very Hindu phobic? Well, um... Uh, you know, I, I used the term Hindu phobia at the time I was writing this book because, you know, it, it obviously had a certain amount of resonance and it seemed like a good way to describe uh, essentially a form of prejudice or bias against uh, a community or a culture. You know, I mean, obviously it's a derivative, uh, you know, in the discourse of the word Islamophobia, which is very, very, uh, you know, taken for granted in, in, in the U.S. discourse today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, since that time, I mean, to, I mean, the more I've discovered of, you know, the thought and writings of others in the movement, you know, I I'm, I feel like probably a word called, like anti-Hinduism is perhaps more accurate. But anyway, mm -hmm. you know, but Hindu Hindu phobia is, I think, uh, uh, easier on the tongue. So, uh, but you know, even when I was writing it, what I found interesting is was, you know, given the fact that even for an ordinary uh, you know, Hindu like me, uh, it, it was very clear that Hindu phobia was not simply a, a form of prejudice or bias against Hindus or against the Hindu culture, but it, it went deeper than that. I felt that it was essentially a cultural antagonism to things that, you know, Hindu thought is traditionally held to be very dear, like freedom, like diversity, pluralism. And most importantly, you know, uh, you know the the adoration and uh, you know respect of nature. 
So, you know, I, the kind of working definition I have for, you know, Hindu phobia is essentially, you know, that it's not just against Hindus, but it's also uh, against what Hindus believe and stand for. And that's, you know, the bigger issue. But in terms of its manifestations, well, unfortunately, you know, it's uh, in the two, three years since I've written this book, the manifestations are just uh, flowering. Well, flowering is a nice word, like they're spreading like more and more weeds everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, it's, 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 you know, quite insane, really, because I, um, you know, I, I teach in, in a liberal arts university in a very liberal city. And, you know, the, the field I'm trained in, which is, you know, critical cultural studies, uh, you know, is, is by nature very progressive and anti-racist and all these things. Uh, but, you know, essentially what is going on in academia is that they have uh, not f found the slightest remorse, you know, at, as human beings, nor the slightest honesty as scholars to pay heed to the criticism that is being directed at them. And I think one of the problems is that a lot of the criticism that has come from the community has also not been articulated very effectively. It comes from genuine grievance, and I know that, but it has not been very persuasive, and you know, we can talk more about that as we go on. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's all over the field. I mean, what, you know, essentially, I mean, the simplest way to understand Hinduphobia in academia is like this. You just took out the word Hindu and put in, you know, Muslim or uh, African American or any other <laughs> group today, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people would lose their job for it. You know, they would be drummed out of academia. They would be called racist and misogynistic. Mm -hmm. But they do ex whatever they want. You know, when it comes to Hindus, you know. And so uh, actually, I wanted to ask you. Sorry, sorry to interfere, but because this is such a vital point you have raised, so I'm really sorry to cut you because I had to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so someone uh, I follow on Twitter, and he's an activist. His name is Faisal Sayyid Al Muttar. So he coined this beautiful term, and I wanted to share this term with you. He calls it the Oppression Olympics. So the the way the academia or the left, you know, think tank or the left society, left leaning society works is they look at everything from the prism of victimhood and oppression. Mm -hmm. So, so there is uh, the homosexual, there is, uh, nowadays, uh, you know, Islam has entered the oppression Olympics and in fact, Islam is the gold medal holder and, you know, unfortunately, homosexuals are somewhere in the bronze medal range. So it's like, you know, the oppression Olympics. So everybody is graded according to how oppressed they are. Why did the Hindus miss the oppression Olympics? That's what I wanted to ask you. Well, yeah, I, I try to, you know, address some of this, um, you know, in, in part one, the uh, chapter called Academic Maya Sabha. Exactly. And, uh, but, you know, the last two, three years of being actively involved with many Hindus who are, you know, working on this, um, a few in academia, but mostly outside of academia, uh, but very, very, you know, smart and dedicated and passionate interlocutors. Um, what, see, what, what has happened is this, you know, I think the, the main dilemma right now is Hindus are very, the Hindu movement is extremely diverse and uh, it, it consists of people with very, very, different backgrounds. Uh, the only thing common is most of them are not in academia and they are not really making the effort to figure out this hall of mirrors that is academia, you know, mm -hmm. and at least, um, you know, I, I won't say the people aren't, I think pe the people gen are, but some of the institution builders uh, in the Hindu movement have really, really not figured out how to do it because it's extremely complicated. But what you just said in terms of this uh, Olympic medal ranking you gave, uh, mm -hmm. You're absolutely right because, you know, I think post Orlando, you remember the tragic attack on, you know, the, the gay nightclub in uh, Orlando yeah. a long ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if that had happened five, six years ago, the reaction would have been very different. But I mean, just the fact that, you know, uh, you know the community which was, uh, you know, perceived to be the most vulnerable uh, community in the United States was sort of brushed aside in the sympathy um calculus you know was horrifying and so it tells a lot tells us a lot about um, you know how calculated and commodified uh, that you know the supposed discourse on oppression has become but having said that you know so this is the, i think the choice this is the dilemma for the hindu movement now mm -hmm. 
you know, if you are in academia today, and, and you know, in a way, academia did get better because you know, if you were in academia, let's say in the fifties, uh, you know, there, there, there was no oppression Olympics. Then there, there, there was just a subjugation to uh, supremacism, you know, or you could, mm -hmm. you could even call it Euro supremacism. You know, that, yeah. that's how it was. You know, they were very no, uh, normative about everything they did. You know, they would have been teaching, uh, let's say, the history of colonialism as simply, you know, the history of, you know, the white man's civilizing mission. Um, and, you know, that's about it. But in the 60s and 70s, there was a huge revolution of sorts. It started with the students on campuses. Um, you know, a lot of it was because of things like the Vietnam War. And, you know, there was a huge questioning. It's not unlike, I think, what Hindus are doing today, you know, challenging all the dominant paradigms. Mm. And as a result of that, I think by the 70s, there was a huge change in academia. And by the time I did my PhD in the 90s, um, you know, things were changing to a very large extent where you had a, an, a, an interdisciplinary uh, field like mine, which... Um, you know, really was paying attention to questions of oppression and power. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which I think was a good thing because, you know, otherwise so many communities would never have a voice. I mean, uh, you know, in, in, in university should be a place where people are taught compassion. People are taught to see uh, the world uh, in, in a honest and humane way. Uh, but obviously things have gone wrong. <laughs> and uh, especially with Hindus and even even uh, some others to a certain extent. And I think what basically happened is that um, when the real wave of decolonization took place in academia in the 60s and 70s, you know, when women's studies and ethnic studies and black studies, mm -hmm. all these things happened, um, it simply didn't happen for us, you know, for various reasons. And I think one of them is simply the demographic thing where, um, you know, uh, some of the people from India who went into these fields, uh, like, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, the humanities, social sciences, uh, mm -hmm. came from a very different uh, background. You know, I think a lot of them were already predisposed uh, to, you know, uh, not, not bothering to understand what was happening in India. You know, they, uh, you yeah. could call it uh, the Nehruvian, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, bias or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And so a very weird thing happened. And so by the 90s or so, uh, the entire field of South Asia studies, which is, you know, really the space where, you know, uh, there should have been a voice for Hindus because Hindus are a part of South Asia, right? So, you know, yeah. if you, I mean, so naturally, if, you know, Asian studies was giving a voice to Japanese and Chinese and Koreans uh, and Middle Eastern studies was giving a voice to Arabs, uh, and you had scholars like Edward Said speaking for Palestine and so on. Yeah. Everyone naturally would assume that South Asia studies would speak for, uh, you know, the 80% population of India too. Uh, but, mm. you know, they didn't. I mean, and on the contrary, the what they did was just so horrifying. It was so absurd that uh, they pretty much turned everything on its head. And, you know... They, they recreated this microcosm of, you know, what was happening in academia on a global scale within mm -hmm. the Indian context. And a lot of it, you know, made, would have made sense if the Aryan invasion theory was true. And, you know, uh, if I walk down the street, I'm mistaken for a privileged white male or something, which I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, so it's something very absurd. So basically, Hindus are supposed to feel guilty for having invaded India in 1500 B.C., and we are supposed to feel guilty, uh, and this is something I critique Professor Doniger on, we are supposed to feel guilty that somehow our Sanskrit texts uh, inspired uh, Hitler and his people to go kill six million Jews. How insane is that? But that is the state of academia today. So, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, very, very, you know, depressed about that. But at the same time, you know, I think the dilemma for the Hindu movement and intellectuals in it is this. So do we, uh, you know, try to completely reject this whole oppression Olympics as as this gentleman you quoted says it, or do we, you know, re reject just a cynical part of it, the part which has gone wrong, and mm -hmm. retake uh, a more honest critique 
where you know all communities do get to speak about problems that face them you know whether it's gays or women or hindus or muslims or jews or whoever you know so i think that is the dilemma where the hindu community sends out mixed signals you know because sometimes you know you know we talk like you know we are we don't believe in victimhood and you know we believe in uh you know our su- success stories uh, but at mm. the same time you know and in fact just today uh, there was a there was an op-ed in the mint by uh, sidin watakot I, I, i don't know if i'm saying his name right which was interesting you know about dunkirk and the whole debate about history in india and mm. uh, i haven't read it carefully just yet, as 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 of now but you know broadly i think this seems to be the dilemma so you know h- how does the hindu movement perceive its own role you know that it, and it is a dilemma it's an open question yeah uh, in my view personally uh, as someone who is uh, actually I, i i mean obviously you are right in the midst of uh, this whole uh, i don't know if fiasco is the right word but is the, in this whole manthan let's just use the word manthan in this case and i don't know who the devas are i don't know who the asuras are that's the funny part too uh, so uh, but as i see it the you know with every uh, ideology or ism or religion or in our case uh, darshana there is one side that is pro it there is one side that is anti it in the outside country like even with islam you know very clearly which side is pro islam and islam is beautiful and which side thinks oh islam has a huge problem in america mm-hmm. everybody knows that mm-hmm. but with hinduism it's unique you will have right leaning conservative politicians or thinkers using ramachandra guha <laughs> mm-hmm. i was like man you would never take a left leaning guy who is openly socialist as an authority on anything in your life mm. but here when it comes to hinduism you'll be like please read ramachandra guha if you want to understand india but uh, and this bothers me but at the same time it also annoys me that why did the hindu side not have the vision and pump in the money required to i know i'm going to piss a lot of people now because i'm talking about arun shori because nowadays you know, everything is toxic but let's say a sitaram goel or a ram swarup you know nobody put in their money to you know put these people on the pedestal it doesn't you don't need to be in the academia per se you can still be known in our in circles but why uh, don't you think it has a lot to do with the hindu side's lack of uh, you know intellectual vision too oh well let, let let's confront the um, you know the in the, <laughs> the, the 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 weaknesses or you know the asuras on our, on our side of the churning you know they're within you know it's very yeah. interesting you said devas and asuras in the month and you know yeah. uh, you know my guru sri satya sai baba once said this was in 1987 when my parents dragged me to go see him and i was there at the guru purnima which now i remember again and again because it was such a profound uh transformative experience to listen to somebody speaking you know all the yeah. charisma or divinity and beliefs those things aside i mean that was my introduction to the existence of an intellectual discourse an intellectual hindu discourse on reality on planet on society and i remember on guru purnima day he said something interesting that uh, you know in the older yugas uh, you know the good guys and the bad guys were you know in different uh, uh you know countries or you know like say uh, rama and ravana but by by the time of the kali yuga uh, it became uh, this, they were in the same family sorry so rama avatar they were different countries uh, krishna avatar they were in the same family and he says in the present day good and bad is inside each one of us and that's where the manthan has to take place so you know with, with that sort of uh, self critical you know uh, idea in mind uh i will say that you know there is a, a serious uh you know problem that uh has you know which even today you know uh, i think has not been addressed adequately enough and you know i i'm trying to write a little more about uh what is happening in the movement because i feel utterly honored that this book you know made me part of a movement that i knew only only a little bit about you know before this you know i mean see when i was writing about misrepresentation of hinduism for the last 10 15 years i was doing so largely as perhaps as a conscientious dissenter in my field in my profession that in media studies people are always spotting bias in the media 
but nobody was doing it for Hindus, you know. And I said, I'm going to do it because I believe in it. Uh, yeah. But because of this book, now I have a lot of friends in the movement, and I've discovered the work of you know the greats like you know Sita Ram Goel. And uh, all I can say is, uh, it has been a tragic loss that the intellectual uh, aspect of the Hindu movement has never really you know uh, had gotten the you know the, the traction it ought to have and a lot of it is because of of attitudes to money and and i'll speak about it a little bit now just to give us a comparison on this you know because uh, uh you know now in the 60s and 70s the left kind of uh, or the academic left you know came into prominence in in, in academia in the us and um you know definitely you know for example one of my dear friends and colleagues uh, was a british working class uh, musician and one of the early uh, scholars in cultural studies you know and in the and in, he came from a working class family in britain and so naturally you know he was very left he hated thatcher and thatcherism so they, you know i think there was that organicity to the left in the west but mm. even though the left became very dominant in western academia the conservative intellectual establishment never went away right I mean, you have all yes. these huge conservative think tanks, you have conservative media, and so they're all there. And in, in India, somehow it has never really happened. So, you know, what you've uh, pointed to with this very interesting example of a uh, supposedly right-leaning or conservative uh, personality quoting uh, you know, a, so a socialist Nehruvian <laughs> yes. writer, <laughs> See, I'll tell you the problem in India, and I've just finished writing an article about it. I Hopefully, it should be published in the organizer uh, next week. I think they're doing a special issue for independence. Oh, my, no. my take is this. The, the movement in India, I mean, I approach it in terms of the establishment in the movement, not really left and right. I think left and right is, is not the most accurate way of looking at it. Yeah. Now, there is a movement in India, and it is growing. And... Uh, and it is, and as people, more and more people join, and the people are joining it because they can see that reality is not adding up. <laughs> you know, that what they're being taught in the textbooks is wrong, what the supposedly smartest journalists and historians are saying seems to be dishonest. So people are getting into the movement mainly through the internet. But yeah. then what happens is th there is no institutionalization happening within the movement, even among the yeah. people trying to do it. And largely because what has happened is I think India is still such an aspirational society that, you know, the Hindu movement is still seen as the poor man's or the poor cousin, you know, that the village cousin that the city, rich city folks uh, are somewhat embarrassed about, you know. So, I mean, I know there's some criticism made about this, you know, with, uh, you know, politically to, you know, with the NDA uh, government 10, 15 years ago and all that. And uh, we don't know yet how it will unfold with the present government. Uh, yeah. I think it's an open question. But I think the most generous way of looking at it is, look, I mean, this movement has come out of, you know, I think uh, a certain kind of desperation. And one organization has played a very important role in uh, sustaining, you know, at least the organizational part of it, and which has given us, uh, you know, a political... Uh, you know, uh, advantage in the sense of, uh, you know, a, a very, very inspiring and interesting figure like Narendra Modi and, and so on. But then the real danger I think that is facing the Hindu movement right now is, you know, the BJP can go on winning elections forever and the Hindu movement can keep growing, but it's all going to be on the internet. It's going to be outside the institutions. And mm the the pinnacle the pinnacle the ideals of what it means to be a successful journalist or a philosopher or a writer is still colonized because and this is where i think the movement has failed to understand what is going on and a lot of it is because there's this very very i think disrespectful attitude that some people have you know in terms of scholarship writing uh, you know things like that i, I think in the last 3 years um, you know i've you know, seeing different people, very well-intentioned people, dedicated people, trying to do things, uh, but they lead with money. Hindus lead, you know, whatever they do, I think, with attention to money rather than 
uh, what is really going on, you know. So <laughs> uh, I should stop there before I get into trouble. <laughs> now, now you touched upon uh, the version of history, and I, I wanted you to talk a bit about uh, a chapter in your book where, uh, which is titled "The Myth of Alternative History." Now, this, uh, you know, this uh, rediscovery of the so-called exotic West or the otherworldliness. Yeah, you know, I have never understood this. What is so otherworldly and exotic about me? I am just another moron, like any other moron. <laughs> so, what is this alternative history, this so-called alternative history? Can you explain a bit of that? Oh yeah. So, so I think the look, Wendy Doniger's book was subtitled, the you know, uh, you know, an alt, the, no, so not main title, and the Hindus and alternative history. Okay. Now, I think what was happening with the you know the whole controversy about that book is, you know, most of the people in the Hindu movement were criticizing. Uh, that book, not for its fundamental premise, which is this alternative history business, but for distractions, mm -hmm. you know, which was the dirty jokes and the really bad ones. You know, I mean, honestly, uh, I, 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 I don't know. Oh well, anyway, I shouldn't criticize uh, anybody beyond a point. But I mean, those kind of you know juvenile jokes and puns are considered mm. to be very, very intellectually sophisticated. But then that was not the main problem in that book. You know? That was not the issue at all. So this is, I think that's a great example to illustrate our previous uh, uh, you know, question. Uh, yeah. what did the, how did the movement approach uh, you know, the, Wendy, the Wendy Doniger phenomenon? I think there was so much of emphasis. I mean, I know there were a lot of scholars doing fantastic work proving that she was relying on mistranslations and deliberate, almost deliberate mistranslations, mm. um, like quoting her own previous mistranslations, for example. But those were all, you know, microscopic. Uh, you know, they were like throwing pebbles at a giant. You know? Yeah. And, and this person is a giant because you know the whole of academia rotates around her, and the whole of Indian, the Indian uh, discursive establishment, which is the media and academia, um, mm. you know, are in awe of her. And and the movement was throwing pebbles by you know focusing on you know distractions I think like you know the dirty jokes, but yeah, the re and that's sort of the reason why I had to address what was the main concern with the field, and that's why I laid it out in that way. Now, see the whole thing about the alternative history is this: now, in the, till the sixties or so, you know, the history that people were taught, say, in American colleges, was the European viewpoint and they would say that we discovered America and civilized the savages and you know yeah that point of view the Eurocentric point of view and then post 60s all that got rejected and you know as and you know that's when this whole idea of alternative histories began you know like mm. you know this famous book by Harvard and called you know people's history of the United States you know which yeah. told it from the point of view of the African American slaves and the Native Americans and all so what Wendy Doniger was doing was selling or or rather, you know, projecting her book as the Indian equivalent of, you know, previously suppressed voices. And that is, you know, a very, very, uh, you know, compelling uh, position in academia and, and not just in academia, but, you know, even in the wider world, you know, because anybody who's you know, sort of broadly socially liberal and who cares for the underdog and things like that, uh, you know, which is most people, you know, their late teens or 20s, uh, most yeah. people are, you know, liberal, they want to be, you know, they, they, they don't like, you know, people being discriminated or oppressed. So, Wendy Doniger's book sort of became the voice or uh, the, sim you know, people just accepted that idea, you know, that this was the voice of all the people who had been suppressed. You know, that this was the mm. alternative history which, you know, the evil Hindutva uh, forces, uh, you know, had suppressed in India. So I, I logically, you know, pointed out why her premise was wrong. I didn't say, her, I, I obviously agree with the premise that, you know, the voice of the underdog <laughs> has to be, you know, respected and recovered. But mm. I had to point out the obvious, which many people, many Hindus know, but don't perhaps know how to articulate, which is, we are the, you know, subalterns here. We are the victims of 1,000 years of colonialism. 
And mm. so what I, you know, sort of set out in the chapter is very simply this, that there has been no, I mean, let me put it this way. What Wendy Doniger calls the alternative history is actually mm. the dominant history, right? That is the dominant historiography. You know, so what, true. I mean, what the, the, the outline, if you connect the dots, the dots there, you know, uh, Indus Valley is not Hindu. We don't know what they are. They're a mystery. And then these Aryans either invaded or m migrated. But, you know, it was very similar to the Nazis taking over Austria and the uh, Europeans genociding in North Native America. This is what she says. Uh, mm. and so the same thing, you know, Aryans, you know, Indus Valley, Aryans, you know, Maurya, Buddhist reform, um, you know, Akbar, you know, the, the same thing. You know, so the same thing. So uh, that was the key point that had to be made, that basically her, the, her, her premise that she was presenting an alternative history was not true. That, you know, the so-called, you know, dead male Brahmin, as she calls it, is not mm. in any way close to the, you know, the figure of the so-called, you know, dead white male that, you know, in terms of planetary history. So that's the reason I think that idea was important, you know, to be, the point had to be made. Now, uh, another interesting chapter in part one was chapter five, where you talk about the myth of a Hindu history without Hindu view of God. Now, could you uh, explain a bit of that? Oh, I think I just heard the, the Hindu sound of God from the Ahobila temple. Yeah. House. Yeah. So for guys wondering wow, what was that Shankhanad? Uh, so I stay right near a temple. So basically that, that was the Hindu view of God right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Narsimha. laughs> yes. Wow, I, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Can you just repeat the second part? I was no, so I wanted you to explain a bit of chapter five, the myth of a Hindu history without a Hindu view of God. I, I wanted you to talk a bit about that because I found that chapter to be very interesting. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, the subtitle of this is Rejecting the Epistemic Premise and Narrative Arc of Hindu Phobic History. Yeah. So, see, I think so. This was something which I, you know, wanted to just sort of put everything together in terms of, you know, what was seriously lacking in, you know, the whole so-called Hinduism studies that was going on in American academia, that mm -hmm. you could read what all these scholars are writing and somehow feel like they're not talking about anything close to. Uh, <laughs> your experience at all i mean what are they even talking about you know and uh, it's it's an and uh, so the point i wanted to make over here i mean i i write here see can you speak of, of a history of the christians or the jews or the muslims without talking about what god means to each of these communities right because see if you write a book called the arabs a history or the iraqis a history then mm. or or i don't know the, the new zealanders a history then religion or God or whatever could be one part of it. It doesn't, but when you talk, what is usually considered a religious category, a religious identity called the Hindus, and you know, you completely wipe out any kind of discussion of what you know the what the Vedas are about or the Upanishads are about. You know, the, the you know the importance of you know questions of divinity and what God means to us. To put it in you know very simple terms. Uh, I think that was the whole problem, and obviously, you know, you know, as I read more in, in, over the last few years, I've realized that this is the you know the core concern, and this has been you know articulated very well by you know uh, you know Bal Gangadhara and you know and many other scholars. Um, but I think you know this is this is a, sort of the challenge where you know we are all seeped in this. We are seeped in this culture. In fact, I think culture is still. Uh, you know, and we've had this discussion that some of my book readings, you know, uh, is, is, is when you use the word Hindu, is it a culture or a religion? And, uh, you know, I'm very about being too extreme about denying either. I mean, I, I do tend to think that it's more accurate to speak of it as a culture uh, than a religion in the typical Western sense. But at the same time, you know, I think there's also a problem if you absolutely insist that, you know, it's it's not... Uh, you know it, that it is not religious. There's no such thing as religion, and so on. So, it's it's a it's a debate. But yeah, I think my my key my key concern here is, you know, to kind of just talk about how 
you know, there is essentially there, there is not there is no Hindu perspective in Doniger's book. You know, it's sort of a an attempt to uh, you know uh, uh, you know create a you know this this kind of fantasy. You know, this kind of forcing us to think about things that traditionally we've not thought about, right? Because what I think, and, and it's very interesting. For example, this this new lecture tour that Vishwad Luri and uh, Jyoti Bhagji are doing. I yeah. mean, I it's, their whole discussion about time in the Mahabharata is, you know, whatever little I've managed to follow is mind blowing, because it actually confirms, you know, our traditional existential existential uh, understanding of time, you know, mm. where. Um, you know, where, where, you know, we do our festivals and, you know, we follow the Panchang and, you know, and, you know, I have a little, you know, play on that in my, you know, my latest novel, Saraswati's Intelligence, because, you know, these ancient Kishkindans, which is Hanuman's people, uh, you know, they they have these things called the three ceremonies, you know, which are very important to them. And, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Hanuman, you know, asks his mother, you know, how, how, you know, so the first ceremony is sort of a feeding ceremony, like the Anaprasan. Um, where they, they, they ask uh, the goddess to help them find food. The second ceremony is uh, like sort of like uh, you know, going to school. And the third ceremony is marriage. And then, uh, you know, Hanuman asks, why, why is there no fourth ceremony? And his mother says, because after the third ceremony, we start with first ceremony again. Ah, brilliant. Right, for the next generation. So that is, you know, the Indian view of time. That is nature's, you know, a dance to you know that that is the assertion of something. I don't know whether to call it spirit or consciousness or the delight of you know uh, divinity embodied in us uh, over this horrible you know cadaverous fantasy called temporality. And uh, obviously, I I, I didn't write all of this in this chapter because my understanding was more limited then. But I, yeah. I think, you know, the, this whole imposition of, you know, these so-called histories where, uh, you know, uh, what is important to us has been messed up, you know, and we have all been forced to memorize this, you know, uh, let me use this in an interview, I rarely get to use it, this BS idea that, you know, we have to carry this baggage in our head that this is what happened, you know, our ancestors were animal herders, you know, who did human sacrifice in Purusha Sukta because they were very primitive and didn't know what to do. And uh, then, you know, the Buddhists and then the Mughals and then the British and now, you know, the postmodern leftists are all civilizing us. So I think this is the ultimate travesty. Yeah, so I, I have started reading this amazing and very important book, The Secrets of the Vedas by Sri Aurobindo. And, oh yeah, and you know, uh, you know, I mean, now I realize that, you know, rearming Hinduism, you know, you know, was, was just the beginning of my journey into this. So, uh, and it is amazing that what you know, Aurobindo writes, you know, nearly one hundred years ago, about I guess the Western Indologists at that time, can be transferred almost identically to what. You know, we are saying now about Wendy Doniger, you know, hmm. and uh, that that shows how little you know academia has changed. So there's this very interesting part where, you know, uh, obviously the the whole or, uh, argument that Sri Aurobindo makes is that the Veda is not this fragmented, you know, crazy thing of you know words being chanted to natural powers and things like that, which is the impression you get both from our ICSE, CBSE books, uh, also from Doniger's book. But what Sri Aurobindo says essentially is that, you know, it needs to be understood. There is perfect coherence, perfect consistency uh, across mm -hmm. the Rig Veda. And, uh, you know, this whole idea of imposing this kind of a materialist reading uh, mm -hmm. you know, is, is a fallacy. And, and somewhere here he's talking about, uh, you know, the waters and cows and things like that, you know, which obviously refer to, you know, mental states according to him. Uh, but then, uh, as, as he puts it, uh, uh, the Rishi Vamadeva would have stood aghast at such an unforeseen travesty of his ritual images. 
and this travesty is of course you know people talking about uh, you know the punis here not as spiritual enemies but as dravidians or dravidian tribes or dravidian merchants so yeah. he says the rishi would be aghast and he says we have not even helped if we take grita in the sense of water hridaya samudra in the sense of a delighted lake and then suppose that the dravidians enclosed the waters of the rivers with a hundred dams so that the aryans could not even get a glimpse of them mm. so if the whole doniger indology materials materialist reading is true this is the stuff that you know we are supposed that is supposed to have really happened in the physical world you know if you read mm. the vedas that you had these dravidians who were building dams and enclosing the waters okay mm. and this is the punch line for even if the rivers of the punjab all flow out of one heart pleasing lake yet their streams of water cannot even so have been triply placed in a cow and the cow hidden in a cave by the cleverest and most inventive dravidians that's so, very nice yeah so i mean sri aurobindo has just nailed this i mean so if the vedas are not you know what are traditional you know practices uh, apprehend them to be and if they are what you know uh, you know the hindu history without hindu view of god uh, say they are then the vedas should be describing you know the water being put into a cow and the cow being put into a cave by the dravidians mm. so that's how <laughs> absurd this doniger stuff is and i quote yeah and <laughs> yeah and to me you know uh, i think it sums up uh, how every hindu child in india is growing growing up uh, at least a significant chunk of hindu children uh, yeah there are uh, hindu children who are firmly based in families that are in the marxist or uh, the nehruvian camp but outside that there is a significant chunk of india that is literally growing up where they go to school they read something that they are you know being taught as history and then they come back home they come back home and their parents say listen now you heard that read that in school that is just to be remembered and forgotten after the exam mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is real history mm-hmm. and i think this is an assault on children mm-hmm. this is not fair to hindu children of india mm-hmm. and and i don't know how to solve this because and i, I don't want to be generalized but i'm sure the muslim children of india are taught something different it's just a fact they are taught that aurangzeb was nice uh, we are taught aurangzeb was bad and then the textbooks teach something and then it's so confusing why you know for me if you want to have history in the eurocentric way which is a narration of events as they happened mm-hmm. that's how i understand history to be in the eurocentric paradigm mm-hmm. why can't we just have and i want to connect this uh, to part 2 that's why i'm raising this point mm-hmm. there is an assault there is an assault on truth and it's not healthy i mean what is the way out of this assault and i and off late in my podcast you know i'm going to talk to a lot of people about this assault on truth i don't know what the satya is i mean when i was you know growing up my father would teach me beta satya ki raah pe chalo Mm-hmm. what is the satya i mean and i think a lot of that is part 2 of your book where, where which you title sanatana a hindu view of god where you know you talk about the concept of tomeva and i want you to elaborate on that concept too but what do you think how do we live as a hindu child you know how does a hindu child grow up in this confused atmosphere then yeah see i uh my my experience obviously i think even in my generation you know which grew up in the 70s and 80s uh you know was somewhat like this where you know the his what we learned in the history book you know like aryans and all this stuff was didn't bother us because it was literally like you know our parents were telling us to focus on math and science and engineering that was it and you know so history was just mugging up something and you just wrote it and came back you didn't really you know pay attention to it uh but then you know uh, you know hinduism was such a big part of our lives because the pujas were there and you were going to temples the festivals were there um uh, there was no not much of a meta discourse about hinduism right mm. I mean, you just lived it the, the way your parents lived it maybe a little bit different but it was largely practice centered you know it was not discourse centered or discourse dominated uh, i think mm. till about the 90s till the internet came along 
Now yeah. you have a very interesting and the, see the way I saw it, and this was kind of what I wrote in my article just after you know Narendra Modi's victory, which was published in you know Foreign Affairs. Uh, you know where I said that essentially this is a, a generational point uh, process of decolonization going on, and mm. the way I understood it was India survived colonialism or rather Hinduism survived colonialism by going quiet. You know we didn't you know fight back you know openly. It was uh, sort of like you know and it, in a way it was the Hindu way of you know Hindu pluralism or diversity. Call it what you will. Uh, but and and this is of course the Ashish Nandi's thesis in um, the intimate enemy, and Ashish Nandi is probably one of the few people in academia who was not as crazy as some of the others, you know, who, yeah. who was fairly I think accurate to at least in terms of the colonial experience of Hinduism and how we resisted it. Uh, now, I think that sort of momentum of living Hinduism without really bothering to define it or getting bothered by wrong definitions of it that lasted quite nicely till the 90s or so. But post 90s, we have this dilemma, particularly with children, because, you know, I, I have, you know, dear friends in the movement who are very, very passionate, very, very smart. And I think uh, we, we all have this secret concern about, you know, what is going to happen with the children? Are they going to inherit this passion? Uh, for defending Hinduism, for taking it back, or is there going to be a backlash, right? And I think that is something that the movement really needs to uh, pay attention to, because uh, what is going, what is happening right now is this. I think the children, I'm guessing children are really torn, because even if a lot of parents are still saying, yeah, yeah, you know, don't ignore, the, like you said, you know, uh, just just forget about the history in the textbooks and you know uh, listen to what I'm saying and all that stuff. Uh, it's not really possible anymore because the debates are getting accelerated everywhere. People are opening their phones and their gadgets, their WhatsApp, Facebook, whatever, and there's a million opinions flying around. And so, what is going to happen right now is I think this and you know we talked a little bit about this before you know having we were chatting. We have to figure out, those of us who believe that, that you know, this Hindu movement has to survive and uh, you know, break down these barriers that are presently there, we have to pay attention to things from the point of view of our children 5, 10, 15 years from now. Now, mm. because what is going to happen is when they're in school, when they're in college, when they're in the workplace, they are going to live and work in a diverse society. You know, they're going to have Muslim friends, Christian friends, American friends, Arab friends, whatever, right? And yeah. they've all grown up, you know, this idea, which is wonderful, that we must not discriminate. We must treat everyone equally. We must, uh, you know, be tolerant. Uh, all these things, all these liberal ideals, they've grown up with it. But what they are hearing from their parents, from us, those of them talking about people who are very passionate in the moment. What they're hearing from us sounds exactly like what NDTV and, you know, the, when uh, Doniger and the left-wing academics tell them about uh, Hindutva. Mm. So some of them may, may eventually figure out how to deal with this. I think a lot of people will eventually figure it out because, you know, historically, I mean, the way it happened for me, for example, I was in an, I, I studied a curriculum which taught me to spot bias in the media and oppression and all that. And then I just, yeah. you know, had my guru's blessings to somehow just say, I'm going to speak up, you know, and I, and I managed to do it. So eventually I think people will speak up, but then, you know, uh, we have to get our act a lot more improved because otherwise, you know, there is a, there is this problem of practicality where you might have a situation where children eventually become indifferent and Right now, the only thing that the Hindu movement is working on, surviving and growing on, is the fact that the Hindus in the movement are not indifferent. They're passionate. You know, they have said this is not right. You know, this is this kind of Hinduphobia is racism. All these things. But then, if you keep sounding, you know, like you know, we don't like Muslims or we don't like Christians, uh, which is what it sounds like a lot of times. Uh, you know, what is going to happen eventually? Our children's. And I think that the, the, this has happened to a very large extent already 
in the second generation kids in america you know because uh, if you if you if you look at the problem in academia here today uh, say till the 90s you had the donigers and pollocks you know they were identified as sort of the main people representing a non indian and non accurate view of us but now we have a situation where you know you literally have hundreds of professors here you know in uh, in, in uh, religion and humanities were all south asian origin or desis as they as they put it and yeah. they're pretty much saying exactly what uh, you know donigar and others are saying and uh, and you know and when when people get angry and you know write to their deans and say you know oh, this person is a hindu phobic racist it doesn't help because ultimately again as i said the movement has no skin in the game you know the movement is outside the walls of academia we are not students if you're not a student if you're not a you know alumni uh, then what uh, standing do you have to email a university and complain about its professors you are actually turning them into martyrs you know so this is uh, i think one of the course corrections we have to think about you know how do we uh, make things um, real for us to for our, for our children so i think the, the in terms of the strategic part we have to get very very uh, you know uh, precise in terms of how we want to uh, teach our children to critique what is wrong with hindu phobia and the second part which is a bigger question which is what you raised is how do we get to satya mm. and my god i mean that is <laughs> such a huge question but i mean the reassuring thing for me is you know when i when I, again when i started reading secret of the vedas uh, which i hadn't read when i wrote for meva you know two three years ago uh, yeah I mean, what sri aurobindo is saying i mean the, the key idea in the veda is again satya it's not even like some god or bhagwan or whatever it is satya so mm. that is the bedrock of who we are and um, you know so it seemed to me that twameva was a beautiful word that helped us understand you know what you know <laughs> i mean that was sort of a starting point for me uh, where you start with this idea of you alone and uh, that is, and that you is of course the divine or the truth you know mm-hmm. that, so satya here is not in that western sense of you know the, a truthful representation of something else but just mm-hmm. truth itself you know so and that that's where i guess my little gandhian philosophy you know was helpful in helping me articulate it because uh, i think you know the idea of satya is really more important than even ahimsa in some ways yeah uh, now i i have to ask you this question again because uh, when when we are in the realm of satya or when we are uh, you know in our journey to satya and i think you you talk about it uh, yeah, in a way in the part uh, in the second part and i want you to elaborate on this but this is this is what i got out of it at least where uh, i think professor balgangadhar used a very good word in his book uh, i think it was the heaven in his blindness where he said the hindu way or the sanatan way has always been indifference to difference mm-hmm. and uh, do you think when we are in our personal journey for finding that satya that uh, the you know if somebody were to ask you know you know you have to find satya so they cannot be both sides to be equally valid now i think the hindu answer pretty much for that both sides being equally valid is indifference to difference uh, wh- what do you have to say to that and don't you think in a world that is so polarized today where everybody is you know you know on a tweet you are uh, you know being attributed motives and you know people cast uh, you know character uh, uh, assassinations uh, you know they start with character assassinations or uh, over tweets so in such an toxic i i genuinely believe the online atmosphere is toxic i mean, i'm very inactive on twitter i just share articles and you know i keep my discussions to bare minimum level on twitter because i believe that medium is not meant for discussion I, the the medium that you and i are using right now this is meant for discussion that's how good old human beings used to discuss things <laughs> yeah now in this kind of a scenario how does one you know because the western way is very unique the western way there is this thing in the west where you know they want to homogenize the truth 
they, they, they have a very fixated version that nope this is it i'm not talking about just you know the hard sciences level i'm not being a relativist here mm. obviously in hard sciences even our philosophy is very much like theirs but when when you come when what i'm talking about is at a cultural level you know the cultural coexistence now they came up with the concept of multiculturalism which i think is a very flawed concept i believe mm. Mm. now what do we do in something like this because i think you approach a lot of this in chapter 3 and chapter 4 where you you know talk about krishna and rama as ka, you know you title it uh, cousins and friends i think a lot of the answers about coexistence do lie in that chapter itself mm-hmm. oh, no no that, that that is a you know a, 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 you know a, a very important uh, journey for us to embark on i think again also in an intergenerational fashion where you know you have this very Uh, sort of a, again a workplace cosmopolitan mall <laughs> cinema internet chat room kind of culture where you know in order to get along it's like oh yeah all yeah, anything is fine it's it's one of two things it's either become like you know middle of the road yeah all opinions are equally valid and you know you just kind of uh, go through society politely and then you know you get into you know, the internet uh, twitter thing and there it's highly polarized right so where is where is truth i mean there is a, a small book which i read a few years ago which i actually quote this in yamin hinduism it's called truth it can, you know there are short essays in it by different thinkers from different parts of the world and i know i remember the essay on truth in the american context was called basically the problem with american classroom relativism mm. so this is part of the, you know the kind of the decay or disintegration of you know, the grand promise of you know the academic revolution of the 60s and 70s you know mm-hmm. ultimately what has happened is it's all identity politics you know so it's like you know everybody is uh, it's i'm sorry but it's like it's almost like you know that same animal farm thing like all pigs are equal you no know, all animals are equal but some are more e- so it's like <laughs> like it's now it has become all oppressions are equal but some opre- oppressions are more you know <laughs> uh was the others or something I, i don't know what's going on but then see what has happened ultimately so truth has become this sort of a performance in taking turns you know mm-hmm. it's especially in the us so it's like everybody gets their few minutes to speak and you know and like you said so multiculturalism is just a management strategy and uh, it is very status top down and you know it, it, in places like england is it has failed badly you know There's an amazing book. Uh, I think it's called Between Fatwa and Jihad, um, and uh, it is basically about the you know Salman Rushdie affair, where you know the I forget the author's name, but you know he he criticizes what happened in in in, in UK in the 80s, where there was this you know kind of this blind uh, embrace of multiculturalism without even understanding what these guys were you know embracing. <laughs> so. that i think relativism is 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 a problem and you know academia created this monster governments um, you know in in the west uh, you know gave it wings and it's all over the place now the backlash to that again is this i don't know whether how, how successful you know uh, you know the, the typical kind of right wing rhetoric you know is and i think in india there is a problem because a lot of this self styled right wing rhetoric i think is a copy of you know the 1990s american right wing rhetoric which was really bad you know to tell you the truth and yeah. um, you know i think it's getting better in india but you know it's it's all mixed up so it becomes very easy for um, you know people in the establishment to you know discredit what we are saying so i i think uh, so let, let me get to the point so <laughs> i i think the real challenge here is you know in terms of satya you know i think the real thing is the choice is not between universalism of the failed old eurocentric sense and relativism which is the failing new eurocentric <laughs> uh, yeah phenomenon but yeah. i think the answer really is you know what i used to call at least in my first book on mtv i called it alternative universalism you know mm. but probably we could just be more accurate and just call it indic universalism you know and Very interesting yeah so i i think that is the challenge in india how 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 do we get the next generation to understand that our 
universalism is actually a good thing and you know it's probably the only way to survive this mess you know uh, i'm glad you got, got this topic out because unfortunately there is no way out of this mess as of now i, I genuinely believe there is no way out as and i think we are in, in the part of a manthan we are in this manthan as a society where i think the hindus are angry mm-hmm. and they're lashing out the funny part is they're calling themselves right wing when they like socialism themselves that's the funny part of it all so uh, I, that's uh, you know we, uh, i always believe we should have a hearty laugh even when we are fighting <laughs> so uh, th- th- that's just the way it is but now in in this whole scenario obviously uh, I, and let us leave the bjp and the rss out of it because i don't believe they have <laughs> although they should be having a role to play in this but i know in india we are such a dysfunctional uh, you know society at a government level that i don't know what's going to happen there yeah. but let us assume no matter who is in power how does a society as diverse as ours i mean we have i i know the west is diverse but i think most people in the west do not understand diversity like indians do and i think indians are very good at handling diversity i mean whether it's linguistic diversity culinary diversity i think the west has failed in one diversity which is intellectual diversity and i think india is better than the west in that i we have been able to handle intellectual diversity far better mm-hmm. now obviously there is uh, i'm going to use an american example and then i'm going to explain why because it's something to do with your book now everywhere in every history there are characters in our past where we have a certain way of looking at our own characters let us say for example thomas jefferson in america now thomas jefferson if i am not mistaken he was a slave owner right mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. now he's one of the you know the so called light uh, founding fathers and i think he also was talking about equality so now let's say you you know there is this young american child you know growing up and you know he's been built on this you know myth of american exceptionalism i mean i'm using the word myth i'm using a leftist term unfortunately but why should and, and i'm going to c- come back to your book so believe me i will i'm just taking a little bit of time uh why should a young you know american 25 year old american not be proud of thomas jefferson the same way you know we you know they're doing the same experiment on indian characters too that's what i'm trying to say mm-hmm. you know there are characters from our past shivaji is the biggest character mm-hmm. you know there has been this attempt to you know showcase shivaji at times as a thief or as a bigot where shivaji i think epitomizes everything that is indian Mm-hmm. so they they kept I, i'm trying to draw a parallel here as to how do we manage this conundrum where i, I believe the uh, the whole left narrative worldwide is basically they look at a society they look at who is in majority and they start bashing them that's the whole left narrative and in that uh, and every society has an ethos and that ethos gets destroyed i i don't want the american ethos to be destroyed either i think the, they they are successful the, the way they are and at the same time i don't want my indian ethos to be destroyed so how do we maintain that balance uh, and why i'm asking you this question is because a lot of your book and the part 2 of your book is actually talking about maintaining this kind of a balance i'm using examples that may necessarily not be in your book but this is at least from my point of view this is what you're trying to do in part 2 yeah i think see satya in, in practice uh has to you know break help us break free from this polarization you know where um, and 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 that is the real challenge today and i think a lot of the polarization is also because of the nature of the technology you know the anonymity uh, of twitter and uh, social media and this instant reaction you know where people are just reacting to things without really thinking you know there's no uh, so it's a mess you know it's a distraction but you know to answer the question of uh, you know the whole you know re- suddenly going around re- rediscovering you know uh, as they put it you know that the gods have feet of clay or some such thing yeah you know i i think in in many ways you know i i think i agree with you you know i respect you know a lot of the americans who 
felt the way they did the last few months, you know, because, uh, you know, with the elections and everything, uh, I, I don't think it's comparable at all to uh, India, you know, because, you know, it's very different. In India, you had a political establishment which dominated for 60 years, finally sort of uh, electorally being rejected. And in, in the US, it's not that much of an outsider thing. Plus, mm-hmm. you, know, you have a much more colorful personality here. But... <laughs> more than colorful. <laughs> you know, I'm just being polite. But uh, but one thing I, I, I could sense, you know, last summer when I started listening to the election speeches and uh, you know all that stuff, you know, it... Amer- so there is the sense of many people in America wanting to just get get their ethos back, as you put it. You know? hmm. And I think in many ways, this kind of artificial, uh, top-down, and ultimately largely dishonest and self-serving, um, you know, illusion of cultural sameness or cosmopolitanism. I mean, it's you remember those old Star Trek uh, TV shows where you'd have, you know, people of uh, one Japanese guy, one African lady, one Klingon, one Vulcan. So it's uh, that sort of thing seems to have come true in some people's minds, you know, with all these big foundations, <laughs> uh, you know, going around the world and trying to create this sort of, you know, I, I don't know who said this, but this was some Twitter wisdom that the left basically promotes, you know, diversity only in terms of skin color, you know. So they want this cosmetic diversity where everyone looks different and uh, all that stuff. But ultimately, everyone has to think alike. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I think you know, in a sense, you know, whether it's uh, 2014 in India or uh, you know Brexit or you know the U.S. election, you know, there is a sort of a return. You know, or people want to return to. You know, who, being who they were, and I think now people have all, but that that doesn't mean it's you know like uh, what do they call it? You know, uh, some going back to some uh, very divisive past. I don't think it necessarily means clash of civilizations. Uh, you know, it, it just means that you know people just uh, because because most people are used to diversity these days. You know, existentially people have to survive diversity, so. Mm-hmm. Even if there have been some, you know, fringe cases of, you know, uh, xenophobia and, you know, violence and all these things in the U.S., um, I am pretty sure that a lot of the people who probably voted for Donald Trump were not, you know, hateful or racist people, you know, I mean, to put it very bluntly. And uh, so I think people just, you know, are tired of this kind of bashing of uh, origins and roots, you know. But how, how yeah. where it will go is a question. You know, it's still very unclear. You know, where it will go. I mean, uh, I actually wanted to read a small part out of your book, and uh, because it kind of struck out for me in this discussion. So please bear with me, uh, guys. I'm reading a part from the conclusion uh, of uh, Vamsiji's book, and it is very pertinent to what we have been discussing for the last twenty minutes. So uh, the the conclusion is called Jagat Guru. So in that, I'm just going to read a paragraph which. You know, it was fascinating to to me. So here it goes. Satya and Maya have never been so clearly polarized in recent times as they have during the 2014 elections. The language of Maya is powerful, persistent. It has the backing of 66 years of post-colonial privilege in India and 500 years of colonial support. It is the language of the powerful, even if it speaks about empowering the powerless and protecting minorities and such. It has become so deceitful that it has been rejected, even if those who have rejected it risk the stigma of being labelled as fascists, dictators, haters and worse. Our kindness must be strong and in the end, stronger than their delusions. I think this line to me pretty much epitomizes what our attitude should be in this month. And and I'm really thankful to you for using such beautiful words, Vamsi ji. Uh, Thank you, Kushit. You know, uh, as I said, you know, these words... Uh, these words blessed me. What else can I say? I mean, uh, I, you know, I mean, I appreciate you know all processes of writing, but this book was unlike any other, and uh, you know, it it has, uh, you know, I I think you know, the, 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 I think the journey now really is about confronting, you know, all these challenges, not just intellectually, but 
with but but from the heart you know i know i don't know whether it sounds very you know indian cin- cinema ish to say that or <laughs> say but um, you know for us uh, you know bhakti is an epistemology what else can we say <laughs> you know it's uh, yeah yeah so i think you know let's confront it with kindness and i i think the only sort of deliberate intellectual struggle that you know i would like uh, you know all of us to pay more attention to is the the importance of language you know i mean i've been struggling to try and learn uh, sanskrit you know the last couple of years you know and uh, i've started and you know left classes several times but every mm-hmm. time now and, and you know in my late 40s trying to learn a new language and that I mean a new very old our own language which is both yeah. very similar it is so familiar to us but at the same time you know it's just you know somewhat challenging but all the same you know i think what happens every time i sit in a sanskrit classes i am forced to remember how beautiful language is i mean i actually remember in, you know in, when i was 15 or 16 um you know the pleasure i used to have discovering new words in english mm. you know whether it was shakespeare or anything else just uh you know discovering words and you know the playfulness the beauty and all these things and i think you know right now what has happened is there is a sort of a widespread functional literacy with language and uh, because all, you know most of us have been, have some training and you know on the internet you know language is very easy to <laughs> deploy uh, but i think where you know the real challenge is because you know we are in this situation where we are part of a movement and like you used the word anger before and that anger is genuine it is based on a deep and genuine grievance uh but you know that anger has to become productive you know it has to breach you know this establishment you know and ensure the survival not just of hindus but again of humanity and of on of the planet you know that that's always our universal hope you know, i i i don't think so we could have ended this podcast in a better way and uh, before we wrap things up vamsi ji uh, can you tell uh, the listeners a bit about um, any current projects that you're involved in yeah i'm trying to write two books uh, almost simultaneously uh, one is almost wow. yeah it's it's uh, tentatively titled covering hinduism and uh, it's a series of uh, essays on uh, you know important american media misrepresentation misrepresentations of hinduism you know starting from mother india to slum dog millionaire and uh, you know the whole cnn reza aslan controversy uh, okay so i am not yet sure i mean I, ho- i hope to get this done by the end of this year and okay. and i'm also working on part 2 of uh, the kishkinda chronicles which is uh, my hanuman novel and yeah so uh, so i need to somehow try and you know do both of these things this year so vamshi ji uh Thanks a lot for uh, coming on my podcast. Uh, I know it must be late at night over there actually right now. So, I'm really grateful to you that you agreed to do this and guys, I'm going to leave uh, a link to, you know, the the Amazon link to Vamshi ji's current uh, book that we have discussed right now and obviously to other books also. I mean, you just click on the link, they always show the other books of the authors. So, like I always say, don't be stingy. Buy books. because for if you want hinduism to stay alive it is very important that you support hindu authors and you support authors that write about hinduism so i i don't believe in requesting my listeners uh, to buy books i believe in shaming them in buy books so i'm going to stick to my shaming tactic so once again vamshi ji thanks a lot for doing this and i'm really grateful to you uh, thank you it's a wonderful forum and i look forward to uh, reading the comments from your wonderful listeners <laughs>